Hey everybody, how's it going? I hope you're having a lovely day. So today I'd like to go over something that has absolutely flooded my inbox, which is, Lewis, what do you think of Google supporting Right to Repair? Google said that they have gotten behind Right to Repair, they're going to support it, and they even want to ban parts pairing. Isn't that a good thing? And the reason that I don't comment on this stuff as much anymore is, I'll be honest with you, I shouldn't say this out loud, but I've kind of started to give up on it a little bit. I mean, I'm just looking at the landscape. It's something I've talked about many times in terms of how there's literally less that a technician coming into this business can do now than they could 15 years ago. And I don't really care about the PR wins. I do not run the type of nonprofit where I want there to be pictures of me hugging disadvantaged youth in poor neighborhoods or something like that. So I get a photo op so people give me donations. I want to create actual real world change that affects people in a real and serious manner. I am not interested in the bylines. I'm not interested of some bullshit photo of me at a bill signing. You will never see me at any of that stupid shit because that's not what I'm here for. I'm here for results. And unfortunately, 99% of the time that I see a headline like this, it's just, it's not a result. So let's dig into this a little bit and figure out what people are excited about. This comes from 404 Media and they are citing this sustainability paper from Google that got released very recently. It says that they formally endorsed and will right to repair and will lobby to pass right to repair laws. And the absolute bombshell here that most people are responding to is where they're saying that regulators should ban parts pairing. So Google is the one saying that regulators should bear p ban parts pairing. Parts pairing is this nonsense where I have a screen in this phone and let's say I were to buy this phone from the store, I'm not buying it from eBay, I'm buying this new, and I were to take the screen out of this phone and then put it into another phone that I bought at that same store, that all the functionality would not work as it did before. Now, a lot of the times this is because of something called serialization and parts pairing. That is, this screen has a specific serial number and if I were to take the screen with the serial number and put it into this phone, which is expecting a screen of a different serial number, even if it's the same part, pin for pin, atom for atom, it is not going to work properly or not work at all because you need a special tool from the manufacturer to pair it. So you can no longer go in the used market, you can no longer go to a recycler, you can no longer take the broken screen from this laptop and the working motherboard from this one and stuff like that and make one working computer again, which I think is horrible. Now just to be fair, sometimes this is not about serialization, it's about calibration routines. And this is something that I've argued is a distinction without a difference. You will have engineers say that this is not serialization, sometimes it is, but sometimes Sometimes it is something called a calibration routine that you need to run, and the manufacturer does not make the calibration routines available to the end user or repair techs, which to me, again, it's a distinction without a difference. I took a working part out of here, I wanted to put it into here, it will not work, and simultaneously you will not even sell me the part if I was willing to pay. Uh, you know what you're trying to do at that point, and Google is saying enough of that. Uh, the problem here is that this is going to have a headline that is very PR friendly, but when you actually look into the details of the paper, like most of these things, it's complete and utter trash, and I'd like to go over that with you. So the headline is Google formally endorses right to repair, will lobby to pass right to repair laws. But let's look through this very long paper here and find some screenshots. I do not have to post the screenshots on the screen because Dog, our amazing Discord moderator, has already done so. And Christoph Howard has also read through this as well. Thank you very much to both of them for being very helpful with this process. If you take a look, there are several elements of this that are just, let's, let's start. Ideally, more devices should be designed with repair in mind, but building products for repairability is often a journey that takes time. By taking a careful approach, OEMs and policymakers can avoid potential trade-offs or unintended outcomes. It meet users' evolving needs and expectations. Nothing bad there, but you're just kind of getting prepared for some corporal bullshit. And here it comes. User safety should be a top priority. Improper repair can be dangerous dangerous, especially if individuals use faulty parts or are unfamiliar with blah de blah de blah It says here that legislation should acknowledge the risks borne by unskilled repairers and allow original equipment manufacturers to provide parts assemblies rather than individual components to reduce the risk of injury. Let me repeat that. They want to provide full assemblies rather than individual components. So what does that mean in the real world? If you're not an electronics technician and you're watching me read this, why am I mad at that? Let's take a car example. How many of you read in the news recently that Hyundai quoted a customer 60000 Canadian dollars to fix an issue on their $60,000 Canadian car. Uh, this is something I talked about recently. The driver had went over an area, some little bit of road debris, and they got a couple of scratches on the bottom of their panel over here. You could take a look in the video, and I showed what happened. So this was on the bottom of some protective cover of the car, and because they got this on the bottom protective cover of the car, they could not replace the protective cover. They could not
could not do any of that. They needed to replace the entire battery assembly, and they quoted the customer $60,000. This whole concept of replacing assemblies rather than doing actual repair is in and of itself the problem. I'll give you a couple of more examples with my particular industry. Say you crack the screen on your laptop. This part that I'm showing on screen over here, a 17 minute video where I'm discussing this whole problem, this is what's called a display assembly. It has the webcam, it has the bezel, it has the hinges, it has the wiring, it has the backlight layers. And that part can be anywhere from $400 to $750. However, the actual part that you broke, the LCD cell, which I show over here on screen, this thing, which is the part that only part I need to replace, can cost anywhere from $38 to $72. If you have a laptop that's a few years old and your laptop's only worth $650, why would you want to replace a $600 part on it when the part that's actually broken is 38 to 72 bucks? Replacing the entire assembly is insanely expensive and unnecessary, and it discourages people from doing actual repair, which at the end of the day, yeah, I'm sure really bothers them when it comes to the bottom line of people buying new ones instead of fixing what they own. Let's say that you have a laptop that costs $1,300, and the motherboard inside that laptop costs maybe, I don't know, like $900 or something like that. This is the motherboard. The motherboard includes the CPU the graphics chip, the RAM, the solid state drive, everything necessary for it to run. So the motherboard is going to be probably like 70% the cost of the entire laptop because that is the laptop. If that breaks, I don't want to replace the $900 motherboard if the only problem that I have is with a chip that costs 4 to $5. What we do, what makes our business useful to society, the reason people come to us is because when they have this broken $900 part, instead of replacing the $900 part, we try and fix the $900 part. Not only does this allow the customer to retain any data that has not been backed up yet, but it also actually saves them money and sometimes even saves them time because I don't have to make a uh, part order for that specific part that I may not have in stock, I can just fix the part that they have. Being able to fix pieces instead of purchase entirely new assemblies, fundamentally at its core, that is what repair is. Replace the entire battery of the car for $60,000 when the car costs $60,000 is full assembly replacement. And that is what they are asking for. I've done videos in this channel in the past where I went over the fact that Samsung was billing people something like $200 for the battery because they glue the battery to the screen. And if you wanted to purchase a battery for your old Samsung phone, you had to purchase it with a screen. And very often the battery battery with the screen actually costs more than the phone. And that is another issue that we have with Google when it comes to right to repair. You know, from a PR standpoint, if I wanted to say that I were a success at what I did, if I wanted to promote my nonprofit in a way that was not that dishonest, I would say that I won. Look, Google is supporting right to repair. Um, but again, what does the, how does that affect real world users? When you're taking a look at the landscape of how things work, if I look at something like a Google Pixel 6 Pro, which was a fairly popular phone, it's only two generations old, it, through Google's right to repair from programs they've put out, I can purchase a genuine screen for $252.99 for a phone that I could buy used for $230 to $250. Uh, again, it's one, it's one of these things where I could buy the phone for $240 to $260, bucks, or I could buy the part for more money and have to do all the work of fixing it and risking screwing it up myself. Again, I could get the PR win by saying, look, I influenced Google to do something, um, but I, I'm not interested in the PR win. I'm interested in, in repair being a viable option for normal everyday people. And it's not going to be if this is the crap that we're reading. But wait, it gets better. When you look at manageable product scope, right to repair regulation should focus on devices that are repaired by an OEM's existing repair offerings. Now, hmm, why is this a problem? I wonder. Maybe the reason that we exist, why was there a demand for somebody like me, somebody so unqualified, so uneducated, that got fired from a job building furniture at the Staten Island Mall for $6 an hour when I was 18 years old? Why was there a demand for us? There was a demand for us because the OEM did not have repair offerings. The entire reason that we exist as an industry is because the OEM will very often say, we don't have a repair solution for this. There is no repair solution for this. So to say that right to repair regulation must focus on devices that are repaired by an OEM's existing repair offerings, well, what if the OEM just doesn't have a repair offering? Solves that problem real quick. Yeah, you understand why I'm not exactly excited about this and why I'm interested in reading more than just the title? This is shit. Well, yeah, like, you, you want me to pretend that it's not? Like, let's be real here. This is... This is shit. The thing is, Google is kicking Apple in the nuts. They are saying they want to ban parts pairing. 
But they're not saying that because they give a shit about repairability. If they gave a shit about repairability, they wouldn't be saying everything else, and they wouldn't be selling parts for more than the cost of the fucking phone. The reason they're saying that, I'm trying to come up with an analogy that works here. How many people here had parents that hated each other? How many people here had parents that yelled at each other all the time? Yeah, great childhood. Anyway, in, in, all, in all seriousness, uh, how many people that had parents that hated each other, that would yell at each other every day for, de- for a decade or so, had this thing happen where at some point you wanted to do something and one of your parents was just very uh, c- suspiciously encouraging of you with whatever it is you wanted to do. And then after a few days passed, you realize that the reason that your mother or your father was so encouraging of what you wanted to do wasn't because they actually gave a shit about you. It was because the other parent said no. So because the other parent said no, their way to be able to get back at the other parent was to be able to encourage you, the kid, to do whatever it is the other parent didn't want you to do. It wasn't because they actually wanted you to go to summer camp. It wasn't because they wanted you to enter the spelling bee or, you know, or, or learn fencing or whatever, you know, take a programming class. It wasn't because they actually cared about your development. They just wanted to stick it to the other parent that said no. And and this is the petty shit that's going on here. In my opinion, does Google give a shit about repairability? Not really. What Google cares about is making Apple look bad. And Apple is advocating for a right to repair bill that does not ban parts pairing or serialization, which in my opinion would be a functionally useless right to repair bill. What Google wants to do, they want to look like the good parent, not because they care about the child, but because they hate the other parent. That's what's happening here. And I, I don't see this as a win. Um, again, when, when I actually do get a win, when there is a win, I will be the first to come out and be happy and excited and everything else. But I'm not going to bullshit you and pretend that something has been won when, in my opinion, it has not. I, like, I, it, would, it would be disingenuous of me to do that. I, again, the last thing I want is one of those nonprofits that doesn't do any good for anybody, has 90% of their money go to, don- to go to administrative costs, and at the end of the day, the only thing they have to show for it are some high-resolution JPEGs of them hugging inner-city school children and pretending that they care, when in reality, they haven't actually produced anything. The moment that I actually produce a result, I will happily come on this channel and tell you. Until then, some healthy skepticism. Uh, What's going to precede the video after this is an advertisement, so if you don't wish to listen to that stuff, I will give you five to ten seconds to take your phone out of your pocket, turn the shit off so you don't listen to it. All right, so uh, I have done less repair videos in this channel over the past few years. After about eight years of the same format of videos, I started to get bored of it, and I decided to do something new. My nonprofit, Repair Preservation Group, created something called this Repair Wiki over here. This is my new outlet for creating repair solutions for people rather than video. What I do is, again, I have all these different pages on a bunch of different products. We have the problem type on the left and the solu- potential solution to it on the right. We have this for MacBooks. We have it for iPhones. We even had it for, we had it for a bunch of different stuff. I'll leave some links to down below to it. And uh, the problem with this is I put a lot of time into this. There are people that put hundreds of hours into creating guides for this website, and it literally got destroyed. Like, I, this wiki got so rocked by spam that the database is just functionally destroyed. It can only work in read-only at this point, which is a, a, a giant fail. We do have a new one that we were putting together, and I was excited to put this new one together. The problem is that the new wiki that we were putting together, it uses a new format for the articles that is different from the format we were using for the old articles. So the articles have to be moved over manually, which we were in the process of doing. So again, like a very, very long iPhone article that I showed you is now reduced to this. And again, it really is waiting on it being manually moved over. This is an easier format for people to write. And a lot of the feedback we got is that this would be a preferable format to, you know, like this 1993 table format in Microsoft Word or whatever. Uh, Again, the problem is uh, all the old articles are stuck on the old wiki, which is read-only, which is only a tiny link at the top of the new wiki, and all these articles need to be migrated over. Uh, This this really sucks, because again, it's one of these things where like a lot of people put a lot of time into putting a lot of free information out there for people, and it literally just got kind of of destroyed. So we have a a, a link over here, repair.wiki slash w slash migrate, where we leave a lot of details. If anybody wants to help and migrating the old articles from the old wiki over to the new wiki. Again, some of these are like eight or 10 page articles on how to do component level repairs on an iPhone or component level repairs on a MacBook or how to deal with devices that are randomly rebooting. A lot of the guides that you'll see on repair on .wiki are guides that you literally don't see anywhere else on the internet. There's a lot of really unique information on here that was archived over the past several years that was put together by top technicians who just wanted to make the field better for other people. And it is um, it essentially got destroyed. I take full accountability and responsibility 
responsibility for that during 2022. I'll be honest with you, through New York State audits and all the other, and moving to Texas and starting fresh and all this crap, I just did, I, my mind was not in the place to deal with the spam issue at the time the way it is now. I do have a proper set of developers working on the new repair wiki to ensure that never happens again. It's my fault. Uh, I should have been, I should have, you know, kept my eye on the wheel a little bit better there. I didn't. I screwed up. And as a result, I have a destroyed wiki. If you're somebody who's interested in helping, I'll leave a link down below for the migration of the old repair wiki to the new repair wiki, because I think it's a crying shame that so many of these amazing articles that have actually helped a lot of people fix these products are es essentially hidden on a website that I'm going to have to destroy because the database is literally just garbage at this point. Anyway, that's it for today. And as always, I hope you learned something. I'll see you all in the next video. Bye now.